Today I'm going to discuss the work of breathing. There are a couple of problems that can arise affecting the work of breathing. One is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. In this example here, what I'm showing is a normal lung with normal alveoli and an emphysematous lung in which we have a destruction of the alveolar walls and of the elastic recoil in the bronchioles. This causes airway collapse. So these two things cause a problem in breathing and in gas exchange, as we'll see in another lecture. Another problem that can occur is called a restrictive lung disease. And in this example, I'm showing pulmonary fibrosis. Over here, I'm showing scar tissue building up around the alveoli, making it more and more difficult to inhale. Stretching the lung is becoming harder and harder, and the gas exchange is also beginning to decrease, which I'll discuss in another lecture. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about airway compression. When we inhale, the diaphragm is contracting, pulling down, the alveolus is opening during inhalation, and the bronchioles are beginning to expand somewhat during inspiration. During expiration, the alveoli collapse, and the bronchioles, which have no cartilaginous rings in, also begin to collapse. At one point, the bronchioles will actually close. If you exhale far enough, the bronchioles will begin to close and close completely so that what's left in the alveoli is trapped and cannot escape. This is what we call the residual volume. So we call this airway compression. Now if we look on this diagram here, we begin to inhale. So inspiration is going along in this direction. And at this point, we ask the individual to exhale as hard as they can. We see a rapid increase in airway flow, and then it starts to decrease and comes down as you continue to exhale, continues coming down until you reach residual volume. If we ask the individual to do the same maneuver but exhale more slowly, we see something like this. Yet it still comes to this point and follows the same line down to residual volume. We could also ask the individual to inhale to approximately two-thirds of its vital capacity and then to exhale. And once again, you see, once they reach this line, it continues down. This individual cannot exhale and get the flow to occur above this line. This is an effort-independent line. And this is the result of airway closure. As you exhale, you're not only collapsing the alveoli, but you're also collapsing the bronchioles. As the bronchioles are getting smaller and smaller, the flow through those narrow tubes is decreasing. So now if we look at the work of breathing, I'm looking at breathing frequency here increasing in this direction, and the work increasing in this direction. It's important to remember that when I talk about breathing frequency, I'm also talking about tidal volume. If I increase breathing frequency in this direction, tidal volume must go down in order to maintain ventilation. If I slow the breathing down, I've got to take deeper breaths to maintain ventilation. So let's look now and see what's happening to work when I change breathing frequency as the result of increased airway resistance. In this example, you're breathing faster, turbulence is increasing, resistance is increasing, and work is therefore also increasing. If I breathe slower, I must also then breathe deeper. And as I breathe deeper, I'm increasing the work to stretch the lung. However, the work of breathing is the sum of these two impediments. So what we're seeing here is total work, and the least amount of work occurs in the valley of this U-shaped curve, which also occurs at the point where these two lines intersect. So if we normally breathe around here and we try to breathe faster and shallower, we're going to see an increased work of breathing. If, on the other hand, try to breathe slower and deeper, we're going to see an increase in the work in this direction as well. So the optimal breathing frequency is right here. So now we're going to look at some of the computer models that I've written to investigate the work of breathing resulting from both elastic recoil and turbulent flow. Let's start with this simple model of a block here sitting on the floor attached to the wall by a spring. And I'm looking on this plot at force along this axis and distance traveled along this axis. And these are arbitrary units for the moment. So let's start by asking how much force would it take to hold this block, say, at position 3, distance 3 units from the wall, overcoming the elastic recoil of the spring. And in this case, it takes minus 5 units of force to hold that block at that point. 
I can continue and plot and ask, how much force does it take to hold that block in that position? Finally, here I am at distance 10, and we can see it takes about minus 15 units of force to hold that block in position. The line that we generate here, connecting those dots, is called our static compliance line. That is just holding the block at any one point, plotting the point, and then drawing the line. Let's change the spring stiffness. I'll come back here, and I'll make this spring much, much stiffer, more elastic recoil, less compliant. And I ask the same question. Unit 3 now takes about 7 to 8 units of force to hold it at distance 3. There's distance 5. Finally, we're at 10. If I were to plot each of those at each distance, hold it, measure the force, move it to the next distance, measure the force, and continue that to 10, we can see now it takes minus 25 units of force to hold that spring. And I can use a much, much more compliant spring. How much force does it take to hold this at distance 7? And finally, at distance 10, very, very little force to hold it there. So we can develop static compliance lines for each of these springs, which will give us an indication of just how stiff that spring is. In other words, how compliant that spring is. I've drawn the static compliance line in this figure in red. And what I'm now going to ask is, how much force does it take to move the block to a given position on this graph? So let's go back and move it to three units of distance. What we can see now is that it took more force to move it there, we can see that by this point right here, than it did just simply to hold it there. The reason it took more force is because of friction. We're sliding the block along the floor. It's also important to remember that the block has not really stopped. I've just taken a picture of this while it is in motion. If it had stopped, of course, we would just be holding it there, and we would be right back here. So let's continue doing this. We'll move it all the way to 10. Now we stop, and you can see it came back on to where it is. We're just holding it at 10 now. So we call this hysteresis. If I increase the friction now, keeping the spring stiffness the same, but increase the friction, what we see is a much, much broader loop. The hysteresis loop has now expanded. It's taking more force to move this block along a carpet, let's say, than it was along a wooden floor. And, of course, if I come back here and now try to move it, say, along ice, we see a much narrower hysteresis. At this point, I want to start this thing moving in a cyclical fashion. At this point, I'm going to have the block moving. And when I move the block, I'm going to pull it out to unit 10 and then let it go. Let the spring pull it back. So now I'm pulling at the unit 10, let the spring pull it back, pull it back out, the spring pulls it back again. And what we see here is a red triangle. Now that triangle represents the work required to overcome the spring stiffness, the elastic recoil of the spring. It has units of force and distance. And if you remember from physics, force times distance is work. The blue loop represents the work required to overcome friction. The work required to overcome friction from the hypotenuse of this triangle over in this direction is work that you have to do. The work to overcome friction moving over in this direction is work that the spring is doing. You don't have to do that work. So the total work involved in moving this block out includes the area in the triangle and this sliver over here of the blue loop, the right half of the blue loop. The left half of the blue loop is done by the spring. You don't do it. Let's increase the friction. And you see we're doing more work to overcome friction. And we can increase the spring stiffness. Now we're seeing an increase in work required to overcome elastic recoil. And finally, what I want to try to do now is increase the breathing frequency. Notice how big the loop has gotten. There's a lot of inertia here that we're trying to overcome. At this point, one of the things we'll notice is there we still see the same work in the triangle. 
to overcome the elastic recoil. Much increased amount of work required to overcome friction. This area was the work that you have to do. And as I said, this area is the work the spring's doing. But what you'll notice at this point right here, the spring no longer can provide the force to return the block to the wall because this friction is overcoming the ability of the spring to return the block to the wall. The spring is now not capable of returning the block to the wall because of friction. So what we have to do then, if we want to keep this block moving at the same speed, we have to give it that last little bit of push from here around to here. So this little piece of the loop is work that you have to do to push that block the rest of the way to the wall so you can pull it back again. Then the spring will bring it back and then you push and so on. If we increase the friction, it gets worse. If we're dealing with very low friction, even at high velocities, you will not have to do the work to return the block because there's very little friction. The spring can pull it back in enough time to get started again. That is the simple spring, which is the elastic part, and the block sliding along the floor, which is the resistive part. And when we talk about the lung in just a second, we will have the same two components. The lung has elastic recoil, like a spring. When you stretch the lung, it's going to recoil back and collapse. And you have airway resistance, which is essentially friction as the air is moving through the tube. We have the same components to determining the work of breathing as we do to determining the work involved in moving this block. Now, what we're looking at, again, in this case, instead of force and distance, we're looking at pressure and volume. Pressure is the force required to move fluids through a tube, and the volume is the integration of flow. We have our lung here. We're measuring using a spirometer. We're going to measure the volume of air and intrapleural pressure. So we'll have pressure and we'll have volume. We can draw a static compliance line. We can ask the individual to breathe to a certain level, hold their breath, and measure the volume. We can ask them to hold their breath, and then we measure the volume. And we can continue doing that, and we develop a static compliance line for this patient. If the patient has very low lung compliance, this is a very stiff lung, we can still measure the pressure and volume and get a static compliance line. Well, let's return this back to normal. Now, in this example, we can see the triangle, which represents the work to overcome elastic recoil of the lung, and the blue loop here is the work to overcome airway resistance. If I change lung compliance, decrease it, make this lung stiffer, we can see the triangle has now increased. The work required to expand this lung is increasing because of the increased elastic recoil of a very stiff lung. And if I decrease lung compliance, I nearly eliminate the elastic recoil of the lung. If I increase airway resistance, now we have an individual suffering from asthma or COPD. The triangle has not changed, but we now see an increase in the hysteresis loop. The work to overcome resistance is becoming greater and greater. In this individual, if I now increase breathing frequency, get this individual exercising, now what we can see is this huge loop. And also what you'll notice here is it's much larger on the expiratory side than on the inspiratory side. This individual is doing a tremendous amount of work to exhale. The individual has to push the air out of the lung because it stops, the recoil stops being able to push the air out of the lung at the right speed in order to keep breathing frequency up. If the person breathes more slowly, it is true that they do have to do more work to stretch the lung, but notice that the resistive work has decreased dramatically. I'm now going to put the optimum breathing curve on this diagram. We see right here, this individual is sitting right in the valley at the moment. If I now increase airway resistance, in order to get to this point where the breathing is optimal, I must slow down. Okay, so now breathing frequency has dropped. Alveolar ventilation is maintained at 5 liters per minute. So this could be emphysema, COPD. It could be uh, asthma. 
uh, something that has caused the resistance to increase. Let's look at a fibrotic lung, low lung compliance. The lung is difficult to stretch. We see an increase in the work, the elastic work here, a larger triangle. Now we'll notice that the optimum breathing frequency is higher than normal. So this individual is now having to breathe faster, but notice that the triangle is getting smaller. Right, we go back. More work because of the increased elastic recoil of the lung here. That work is decreasing. We see resistive work increasing, but increasing very little. So as a result, this individual should be breathing faster and shallower in order to overcome the difficulty with stretching the lung. The asthmatic patient, go back to asthmatic patient, should be breathing slower and deeper. We can see that over here. The work to overcome elastic recoil has increased. The triangle has got bigger, but the resistive work has decreased. So the optimum breathing frequency for this individual would be somewhere here. And these numbers, by the way, do not correlate directly with an individual. They are taken from some of the work of Otis back in the 1950s, calculating work of breathing. Well, let me try one other. Here we have high lung compliance. If I ask students what does high lung compliance indicate, they'll say emphysema, destruction of elastic recoil of the lung. If you look at the work of breathing, if that's true, why wouldn't we all want to have emphysema? Because the work of breathing is lower at any breathing frequency. And the answer is because this is not emphysema. This is emphysema. Emphysema is accompanied by high lung compliance, little elastic recoil, and high airway resistance. That is, the bronchioles are beginning to collapse. And if we look over here, we can see the triangle is almost zero. There's almost no work uh, to increase the lung because of this high lung compliance. It also means that you have to work to exhale. Because there's no elastic recoil left in the lung, when you reach this point up here, you're inhaling along here, you reach this point, if you just let go and allow the lung to collapse, it won't collapse. So you have to push. You have to work to exhale as well as to inhale.